All right, good afternoon, family. Uh, welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron Council. This is Trey, and today I'm gonna go over some issues in regards to jurisdiction. We're gonna get into depth. Many people have a, um, I don't know, like a, a kind of a lack of understanding when it comes to jurisdiction, how it's obtained, um, how it's voluntarily entered into, and we're gonna go over some of that today because I've noticed that a lot of people are taking on these <coughs> various advice from lots of people. And, you know, it could be everything from don't show up to court, just send this notice to, you know, argue the court. And I've had a lot of experience in, you know, auditing people's cases and circumstances. And um, typically, someone comes to me after they've tried all that and it's failed and then we have to clean up the mess. So it kind of got me thinking when someone contacted me uh, the other day about, you know, the advice that she had received to not show up to court. And I, I, I can't stress enough. That's not, that's not a good idea unless you really, really have studied and know what you're talking about, understand some basic concepts. Um, uh, you know, I'll be the first to tell you that I have, uh, myself use some private methods and, and such, but not when my kids are involved. <laughs> so that's another kind of scary topic. And if you have kids involved, I, I don't recommend you take anyone's magical advice that some sort of motion or affidavit is going to suddenly fix your circumstance. It's not. Okay. So I, I just want to make that so very, very clear. And I hope that in uh, sharing what I've, I've learned and my education, we will have a deeper understanding of why jurisdiction gets you tied up and how, and we'll go over um, uh, things you can do to prevent it so that you don't find yourself in certain circumstances. But you know, if, if someone's telling you to file some forms and you don't even know what jurisdiction is, then please don't do it. <laughs> Just please don't do it. Uh, you know, get, get into the books, learn some things. Hopefully these videos will help shortcut the many years that I've been studying for you down to maybe, you know, a month or two. The fact of the matter is there is no way someone who has no study time is going to effectively stop an action against them based on one motion or a few words of advice from different people within different groups. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, I, I can appreciate most people have the most wonderful intent and want to help, but you know, before you take advice from someone, find out how many times they've actually been in the courtroom. Find out how many times they've actually applied these methods to their own case before you decide to do whatever it is they're advising. I mean, that's just common sense, friends. If, if someone has no applicable knowledge, then why would you assume it's effective? It doesn't make sense. And I hope that we can start learning a little bit more on how to use our critical thinking skills and deductive, definitely some deductive, um, uh, what's it called? Like some deductive uh, principles to zero down. What exactly are we trying to do? Does it make sense? Uh, you know, just deductive reasoning logic is something, if you ain't got it right now in this moment, and most people, the scary thing is most people think they do. I'm telling you right now, you don't. <laughs> so <clears throat> if you don't have that basic skill, just throwing darts at something isn't gonna make the darts stick. And I can't express to you how concerning it is because I have seen so many people fail in this attempt that it's becoming quite disheartening and sad, really. And um, I don't wanna see that happen. So I'm hoping that by you know, sharing with you my own personal educational experiences and uh, my own personal um, applicability to some of these things is going to open up your mind to learning what it means and how the game is played when one is trying to get jurisdiction. There's a lot more to it than what you're being told. And hopefully this will clear some of that up and get you on the right path to understand how to better study. So we have to learn government, friends. This is our civic duty. 
I've been doing that for a while now and I'm helping you to learn it hopefully in a quarter of the time it took me. So what we have to understand about jurisdiction is that it actually begins with what is called divine providence. Okay, so this is the law of nature. Uh, divine providence, you know, it's typically um, something you would think of if, if you've studied uh, the Bible and understand how uh, God is viewed to be the authority over everything. So in divine providence, although, you know, people get frustrated and upset, they say, okay, well, I'm having this hard time. God isn't stepping in. Why isn't God helping me? All right. So what happens is that we, we explain that by saying that it's not that he's not helping you. He clearly has designed this specific intervention for you in order to wake you up, bring you to the point where you determine that you actually do need God in your life. And this is designed to bring you back to God. It's not that he is hiring evil people to come into your path. It's that he is allowing it, right? So he could stop them at any time, but because he's not stopping them, and he is the ultimate highest power and authority, that means that he's allowing it. It's just, you know, it's, it's how you have to kind of change your way of thinking when you're dealing with any agents, whether they be police or CPS, because this is directly relative to the um, principal and agency relationship, okay? When we put our trust in someone to do a certain task for us, it is presumed that they are always going to do what I or you specifically permitted. If they go outside of that box and we say nothing, it is then presumed that we still, by authority, are allowing or permitting it because we didn't specifically step in to stop it. This is where jurisdiction begins, so I hope that everybody stays tuned and pays attention so that you hopefully will come to a deeper understanding of what jurisdiction is and what kind of persuasive or coercive methods are utilized in order to basically bend your will to the will of another. Once you have your own free will intact and you're, you're normally gonna say no to something, the other party then can either persuade or coerce you to do what you otherwise would not have done. So if somebody wants you to say, borrow them a hundred bucks, you say no. And in your mind, it's solid. You're, you're not giving a hundred bucks. You know, you can't trust the guy, whatever the case may be. But then he will try to use persuasive arguments in order to get you to give him the hundred dollars, regardless of your feelings, regardless of your own free will saying no. So he will persuade you by saying, look, you know what, I got this new job. And so now I know for a fact, I can get not only pay you back this money, but I'll pay you back the other money. Would you please borrow it to me? Eventually you say yes. <clears throat> this means that you were persuaded from your own free will to do something that you weren't otherwise going to do as a favor to that person, that's persuasion, okay? And then there is coercion. So it would be like, give me your $100, and if you don't, I'm gonna expose all your secrets to the world. That's coercion, and that is threat. And that, was, that is what changes the game, and this is in every time we have any relations with any other person on the street. It could be a cop, it could be a, a normal guy. If you come to me, and I don't know you from Adam, and you say, sit down, and I sit. Well, it's not because I felt like sitting, it wasn't my free will to sit, but what happened is through that commanding voice, he either intimidated and or coerced me into sitting. But when I did that and I didn't object to it, what happens now is I have also held out that this person has authority to tell me what to do. So simply because he said sit and I did it, and I never said, I'm only doing this because you're telling me to and perhaps you have a gun or perhaps you're bigger than me and I'm afraid of you. It now means that this person has assumed jurisdiction over me in trust. <clears throat> That's an agency relationship. So now 
if anyone out there sees him telling me what to do and I am submitting to his commands, I am not operating of my own free will. I am operating through the will of another, someone who I have given my free will to, and now they are basically operating me. So this is agency and principal relationship in the sense that when you're dealing with uh, a police officer or a CPS agent and so forth and so on. So this is something that I want to make sure everyone is really clear on because jurisdiction doesn't only begin just because you're in a certain state in physicality, right? It doesn't only begin in that way. It begins through uh, many, many other means. If you've behaved a certain way up to this point, then you have expressed that you are being governed and want to be governed and trust these so-called states as being the governing body of your actions, okay? Because they have either persuaded or coerced you to bend to their will and not the will of your own. And we'll kind of get into to more deep detail about that, but um, <clears throat> it's really, really important to understand when we're talking jurisdiction, how it is persuaded or coerced in a deep way before you start throwing out <clears throat> somebody else's uh, creative works. You, you, you got to really buckle down and, and learn this. So this might be a little bit of a boring video because we're going to get into details about it, but I recommend, highly recommend that you stick in, in there and um, pay close attention if you already don't have that very basic understanding. If you have that, it might, it might be, this might be redundant for you. Um, if you already kind of know the, how it works in that sense, but I'm going to give you exactly some scenarios <clears throat> to, um, you know, true story scenarios to tell you how the police do this to you with psychological persuasive games. And once you get to the court, the court does exactly the same thing. And I'm gonna give you some examples so that you know how to identify it when it is occurring at the moment you're engaged with someone. And like, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be a court or a police officer. There's a lot of things that entail in that, but, um, Hopefully, again, this will develop a better understanding. Okay, so <clears throat> when we get into jurisdiction and, and authority and agency, we'll also kind of go through a case that I'm showing here that it really breaks it down quite, quite nicely. Uh, this particular defendant challenged uh, standing and they also challenged uh, subject matter jurisdiction. And it really breaks it down very nicely to explain to you how and when a federal court may or may not have it. Um, this case is also uh, very uh, detailed as far as how the inner workings of the social um, assessments behind the scenes happen for cases. So that's something I'm also going to get into at another time and highly recommend you learn that as well. So you have to understand that each of these people you deal with every day, they are social workers. They have certifications to conduct observations of your behavior. And if they come, with, come up with the determination that your behavior is somehow erratic or abnormal in comparison to the other people in your community, this is when they begin to make the attempt to exercise authority. Because if you have a social defect, you can't make good decisions on your own. And now these so-called service providers or public servants, whatever you wanna call them, this is why they then take authority uh, basically to protect you from harming the public or yourself because you have this social disability. And there's your agency relationship that is created at that moment. <clears throat> so an understanding, um, the very bare minimum basics on agency relationship, it goes back to like I was telling you with divine providence. If I am the principal, uh, I have many duties that I have to accomplish. I can't do it all by myself. So I'm going to entrust a portion of those duties to someone else so that they can carry out that particular portion. And um, I'm going to trust them to do that within the scope that I have provided them to do it in. Now, if they go outside of that scope, 
that would be considered to be them um, operating like on a whim in a way that requires them to use their discretion. Uh, so we know that we can map out a specific scope of duties for someone, but we also know that things will occur where that person um, may not be able to remain within the scope if he has to act immediately based on something that's happened. He might have to make an executive decision to do something that's a little bit outside the, the box. And as long as I say nothing about it, that's okay. So if even though it's not, you know, he wasn't doing exactly what was in writing, if he uses his discretion and I don't complain, then I permit him using the discretion to do that now and in the future. But if he uses his discretion and he gets outside the scope of his authority on several occasions that causes for harm or injury to another person, he is not the liable party because of the fact that I have permitted him to do this in the past. So therefore, if he does in fact hurt someone while acting outside the scope of his authority, I, the principal who hired him to do this duty, am now the liable party for, uh, for the injured because I could have at any time noticed him, he, he couldn't continuously act outside of that scope or told him, you know, you need to stop right there, you're getting too far. But because I didn't do that and it caused someone to get hurt, I'm now responsible for it. And so this is a, a, a kind of a relationship that, that we really need to dive in deeper in, in understanding. I know that over the years, I've heard people mention, you know, the principal position, the trustee, the beneficiary, and we switch hats so frequently. It, it, it's hard when someone's telling you this to really deeply comprehend what they're saying until you get some further learning. And I realized that I think that what we do when we've come to a certain level of understanding is we forget that other people aren't at that same level. So we presume that you all understand when we talk about fiduciary relationships that you just, you just know what that means. And so I'm going to hopefully break this down in a way that you don't have to go reading for years to find out what it means. I'm just going to tell you. And that way, you know, you'll be more prepared. You'll be, you know, a, a little bit better informed to move forward with whatever your endeavors are. So this isn't legal advice, and I'm not telling you what to do or how to do your case. This is just educational so that you can get to the amount of education and um, comprehension that I have in hopefully a fraction of the time. So that's what I'm trying to do here, because it is our civic responsibility to learn government, and it does take all of this to really learn how government works. This is not something I've, uh, uh, not a quarter of this, I haven't been taught in school. And throughout the journey here, I've never heard any of the um, other people teaching law and stuff in the groups. I've never heard them mention any of this. So I hope this is very, very helpful to get everybody into a more level playing field of understanding. Um, <clears throat> so when we're talking about this, agency relationship. I think the best way to describe it is like a doctor-nurse relationship, right? So you have a doctor who's earned a higher level of, of education and a higher level of degree of knowledge, okay? That degree expresses that he is more knowledgeable than a nurse. But because a doctor has so many responsibilities, he is able to hire people underneath him, such as a nurse, a CNA, you know, an administrator, a secretary, in order to get his job done with, you know, the best possible practices and procedures for the best possible outcomes for his patients. So he will hire this staff that has a lower level of knowledge, okay? So they do not have his expertise in the field of medicine, but they do have a certification or degree to do their part within his practice, okay? So now you have this professional or, you know, degreed, highly knowledgeable guy who delegates his authority to each of these individuals. He is also liable for any of the um, mistakes that these individuals do during the course of their duties while working for him because it is his duty and his responsibility to give them the appropriate guidance and instruction on what they can or cannot do. 
Okay, he needs to be aware of what they are doing and if they are doing something incorrectly, he needs to catch that and correct it immediately. So if the doctor being the degreed professional of higher level of learning has a nurse walking around, you know, taking the vitals of the uh, patients and that's all she's supposed to do and ask a few questions. If the nurse goes outside the scope of that authority, say by giving a diagnosis to a patient, then the doctor is now responsible to correct her behavior through disciplinary process. If he chooses not to, then this woman, this nurse, will do it again, and again, and again. And as long as he's not stopping her from doing it, this becomes customary practice and therefore, she has every reason to believe that it is permitted for her to make diagnoses, okay? So she shouldn't, she doesn't have to think that somehow she's doing anything wrong because the doctor hasn't corrected her. He's the principal, okay? So as long as she keeps doing these things and he doesn't do anything to stop it. Now, at some point, maybe a patient is, you know, diagnosed by her, goes home and doesn't see the doctor because he's satisfied that the nurse gave him that diagnosis. He thinks he can do, I don't know, herbal supplements. And it turns out that wasn't the case and he gets injured. He's not going to go after the nurse for the, the bad diagnosis. He's got to go after the doctor because the doctor is the one who is in charge of the organization of his own practice. And the reason I want you to understand that is because this is how your agencies and government operations work also. So when we have a doctor, he received an education from someone who had an even higher level of education than he. So typically that will be a university professor who has earned their PhD in order for them to teach this man to become the doctor that he is today. This person, this particular guy is actually defined as being a white man. He could be black man, he could be a Hispanic man, but technically speaking by you know, legal terminology, he is actually a white man. The term white isn't about skin tone. The term white is about people who have a higher level of knowledge and are capable of leading everyone else. And therefore, because they have this higher level of knowledge, we presume that they should be the leaders since they know more than we do. And then we should follow them in their instruction because of their higher level of knowledge. So now when we go down the ladder there, so we have this professor who's able to teach because he's, uh, <coughs> more understanding and more experienced practice and knowledge in that field. When we look at the nurse being of a lower level of education, she can only know what she knows. The only knowledge that she can receive is from those people, from the whites, right? So anything that they tell her is received by them. It is not of her own accord or her own capabilities in elevating to that same level of knowledge. This is her do basically doing what she's told to do and the way she's told to do it. This makes her by definition colored. So this is why when we think about color of law and color of authority, we're not really always looking at it from its true origin of, of existence, okay? So white men are not skin tone of pasty or tan or dark or whatever. White men are your PhD, philosophy king, higher level of knowledge, and because of that knowledge can and should lead the rest of the people. Anyone who is below that level would be colored. So the nurse would be colored. A police officer, although he works for law enforcement under the legal field, he does not have the same level of education as the professor who taught all the attorneys. Matter of fact, he's way below that standard, subpar. He cannot be expected to have that level of understanding because he's not meant to. So um, he is also colored. So when he comes up against you and you say, feel that your rights have been violated, then this is why 
we say that he is operating under color of authority. So he's not the authorized party to make a legal determination because he's incompetent to do so. He didn't take that, those, those classes to become an attorney. He didn't go to school and figure that out. The attorneys have delegated to him how much authority and what the scope of that authority look like, and he's just simply following their instructions. And because he has a higher level of knowledge in the legal field than even you do, it is presumed that when he approaches you, because of his superior knowledge, he in fact does have authority, unless you show him he's wrong. So now this is where we get into the Jedi mind trick, right? So <clears throat> if the cop has a lower level of knowledge as far as what the authority states he can or cannot do, this is where we kind of get into the ignorance of law is no excuse if you have a legal authority to back it up, right? Technically, it is an excuse in a sense. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail on that, but it can actually be used as an excuse in some of these circumstances. Because of the reason, the cop has customarily been practicing a certain sort of way, and he has always used his discretion to go outside the scope of his authority, it is presumed that he is therefore acting within his scope of authority. The only people who can make that determination are his bosses, the people who trained him, the ones with the PhDs, the ones who have a superior knowledge over him. So if we hit them up and say, hey, this guy seemingly has not been uh, notified by you that say failure to identify is actually not a crime. And he is continuously and customarily arresting people and here's the records that show that he's arresting these people so you must notify your agent that he is not acting within the scope of his authority it is causing for injury or will cause for injury to the public and this is your liable party okay so who's teaching this guy who is watching this guy in that specific profession to see if he's doing all the right things Okay, so this is why we need to understand what it means when someone violates your right under color of law. <clears throat> color of law is really an educational scientific term. Okay, so color of law authority or color of law in and of itself is simply saying that it is not conclusive what we're taking you in for, what we're charging you with. It is colorable because it's not, there's nobody competent to deliver that message. There's nobody competent to really say or make a determination whether or not it is lawful or otherwise. We can only really operate under common knowledge and common sense of the commoner. And the policeman that may have a little bit more common knowledge, but he still is at the same, um, level as us as being colored people so they created a fake kind of um, perception of what the words colored and white meant during the civil war on purpose this was a very deliberate move they wanted to change what the cultural <clears throat> belief was in order to hide who is doing what to whom this way we can create <clears throat> a diversion and uh, division amongst people because all of a sudden if if we put up these uh, bathrooms with labels only for whites only for coloreds if we put that in our schools um, if we keep that pressing and um, use words that mean ignorant the truth is colored means that you're ignorant not in not in an insulting way but just that you don't have the same higher level of education to understand things the way the professionals do. So they kind of bastardized the true meaning of the word by creating a controversy that was horribly painful and created division amongst the people. So now whenever we think of the word colored based on the movies we watch, we always associate it to being someone who is black color, or dark color of skin and not actually what it means which is just means lack of knowledge and they wanted us to think that way because pr 
prior to that occurring, there were actually individuals with dark skin that were judges and attorneys and philosophy kings. It was not simply pasty people or Europeans. There were um, judges and stuff that you can trace back into the early 1800s. And how did they get there? You know, their family passed it on and passed it on. So the reason for that is because colored meant you just didn't have your PhD, basically. And white means you do. So one white man against another white man, they could have tan skin and dark skin, but they are still two white men with a white man problem or white man privilege. So to understand that is very, very important because when you decide to, if you'd ever decide to bring a suit under color of law, there is some very specific and relevant factors that you can apply in regards to being colored. So there are discrimination factors at hand that because we stopped understanding what the word colored meant, we could have been raising these issues the whole time about it. And, and, and it's totally in regards to color, colored people. So <clears throat> legislatures being of a superior knowledge and understanding in law, write our legislation and they give privilege to the actors who are both acting under color of law authority and the ones who are also operating in the higher capacity as white. But they do so with our ignorance in a way that doesn't make sense. So if we're going to favor these people who are white, <clears throat> would we be writing laws to protect whites in discrimination of coloreds? Something will go down the path later on because although I have pale skin, I am actually a colored person. I do not have my PhD. So because I am a colored person, I do feel that there is a chance here to, that, uh, to, to show that I have been discriminated against as far as the uh, Congress and Senate is concerned in many, many ways because the laws that they're creating or legislation they're passing it protects whites in a much more profound way than it protects coloreds. And they give a lot of exemptions and a lot of um, indemnities and immunities to whites that the colors don't receive. So that's discrimination in law. But we'll, we'll explore that later. I just want you to have a really good general understanding of what it means to have authority, agency, and jurisdiction in both the <clears throat> written jurisdictional understandings as well as the, the the psychological part. So <clears throat> this particular case that I'm looking at here is involving children that were involved with um, Washington DC's institutionalization services, juvenile court. So as it turns out, they're not supposed to in institutionalize you. That's actually what the court is trying to, uh, when they say they're protecting your rights, this is what they're talking about not your constitutional rights, okay? So they think that based off of the social workers who've given the observations of your behavioral problems, they then come to this belief that you have a mental or social defect. And because you have a mental or social defect, then that also means that you are facing the possibility of being institutionalized. And they have to do everything in their power to give you what are called community-based services in lieu of incarceration at to the best of their ability, unless of course you refuse those services. If you refuse those services, there's nothing they can do and it may lead to your incarceration. So these are why we call these correctional facilities and correctional services is because they are not for punishment. They are to um, service you and puts you in a position where you can relearn or be re-educated about your social behavior because it doesn't, it doesn't fit the mold. It is not the same as all the other people in your community. And that's what they're trying to do is to try to get you back in line so that you will behave exactly the same way as everybody else in your community, okay? So 
how do we understand this a little bit better? I'm going to go through the, how these people are talking about they didn't have a jurisdiction to bring the plaintiffs, or I'm sorry, the defendants into a lawsuit. So it kind of really has a good explanation. And I hope, again, that it, it clarifies things for you in a much deeper way. <clears throat> All right. So first here, they're talking about MJ has standing. Okay. So the reason is because the defendants, the first thing they did right out the box was challenge the standing for many different reasons. And the court is providing an analysis as to whether or not they believe and why they believe the standing is actually exists. Okay. So <clears throat> this is something, in my opinion, like this is something that we always want to do, or at least I personally always want to do very, very first before anything else. All right. <clears throat> Remember now, Everything that happens, you should always have, or at least I always have, a affidavit to back it up, all right? So if the court is lacking in jurisdiction in both personam and, and subject matter, it has to be addressed prior to us filing anything. And the reason for that is because if you ask the court for any favors at all whatsoever, that is gonna be considered to be pleading to the court. If you are pleading to the court, Remember when we talked about divine providence, it means that you then are saying, I can't handle this for myself. So therefore I'm gonna put it in your hands and entrust you to handle it for me. So anytime we ask for help, it means I need your help. And uh, this part of my life is, is not manageable by me. And therefore I want you to manage it for me. So this is how we get into these um, personal jurisdiction dances, right? <clears throat> now, this one is going more over subject matter jurisdiction. So before we go into that, I just want to explain that personal jurisdiction issue a little bit further. So I file an affidavit explaining why I'm not able to give a informed plea off of the claimant's claim. Okay, so in my case, the claim is a lawful stop uh, commenced and then a lawful arrest occurred for failure to furnish an identification, but I am being charged with a subsequent offense called obstruction of identification. And uh, that's an issue. <clears throat> that's an issue because it makes no sense. It's contradictive. So there is no law obligating me to furnish identification to begin with. But the actual charge, okay, so he's claiming he made an arrest for me to, for, for my failure to identify, but he's not charging me with that. He is charging me with obstruction of identification, which can only occur after a lawful arrest is made. It's subsequent to the arrest. So it would seemingly be mis impossible or possibly a mistaken fact that is uh, submitted by the claimant for a couple of different reasons which is why I would challenge personal just jurisdiction because if the officer didn't have authority to arrest or charge me, then the courts obviously won't have jurisdiction in personam either. So the first challenge would be that the law, the arrest, or the, I'm sorry, that the um, stop was a traffic stop and therefore it was lawful. There's two issues with that. Number one, it wasn't a traffic stop. It was a stop conducted based on an ordinance violation. Number two, the officer making the claim wasn't present at the time of the stop. He was not the one who personally stopped me. So how can he legally uh, decide that it was lawful? He can't. He can't make that legal determination if he wasn't present to physically observe it. Uh, then he says, I failed to furnish identification. Yes, um, I did fail to furnish identification. That is a fact that is not being disputed. However, there is nothing in our law in my state that authorizes him to make an arrest for me exercising my Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights and not furnishing said identification. He's not charging me with that. Now, remember, he only arrested me for that, but there's no charge. That's contradictive. But after I failed to furnish said ID, he now proclaims I furnished false identification. So we can see by the claim alone 
that there is several mistake of facts put into the record that may lead the court to prejudice or bias my character because it sounds bad, but you know, on its face, you can see that the facts are way off base. And uh, this is why I would say that the court doesn't have personal jurisdiction because the officer did not conduct a lawful stop and therefore nothing else would happen thereafter. You know, court can't take jurisdiction if the officer didn't have jurisdiction. So hopefully that's a little bit more clear as far as personal jurisdiction is, is concerned. I did not submit personal jurisdiction to the officers through agency, like we talked about earlier, because I did notify them that they were in fact in violation of the law uh, by utilizing their oscillating lights without permission from the vehicle owner as required by statute. And I did ask for them to furnish that permit that is supposed to be inside of the vehicle. I also explained I did not stop the vehicle for him to solicit me because I know I'm not in commencement of a crime. I asked him if there was an emergency. He said no, so clearly he didn't need my assistance and we should have halted at that point. If he still felt the need to give me citations, he could have done so, but instead he detained me for an extended period of time. So personal jurisdiction would have been given to the officer had I agreed to all that, but I clearly told him there was no reasonable cause for him to request my identification because he has a lead system where he has already positively ID'd me. He already admitted that he didn't believe I was a criminal and he admitted that there was no emergency and he could not furnish the permission to use the vehicle's oscillating lights as required by statute. And therefore I pled the fifth and I let him know that what he was doing was unauthorized. And then we had two more officers come up to the scene and basically cover up his crime because that is a class two felony. And instead they retaliated and arrested me. So none of this is lawful, none of this is even legal, but it also means that I never submitted to jurisdiction with the officers and therefore the, the, the courts cannot obtain personal jurisdiction. So on this case, we have the subject matter jurisdiction and the standard of review from the court under what is called Rule B, Rule 12B1. So the defendants are saying that these people bringing this claim don't have the subject matter jurisdiction to invoke, invoke the court. So as they go over that, it says a federal district court may only hear a claim over which it has subject matter jurisdiction. Therefore, a Rule 12B1 motion for dismissal is a threshold challenge to a court's jurisdiction. And that just means that was a federal act violated? Is there federal protection surrounding this certain subject that we can invoke the court to hear upon? And so in this case, they're citing the um, ADA or the American Disability Act. So obviously there is at least one of the acts that would invoke the court's jurisdiction over the subject matter. And now the court just has to assure that the claim is valid and then they can go ahead and assume jurisdiction. Okay, and that's subject matter, not personam. So the subject of the matter in this particular case is whether or not the Washington, uh, Washington DC entity has provided mandated services to the subjects uh, throughout the course of their incarceration as required by several different acts, okay? So therefore, Rule 12B1 motion for dismissal is a threshold to challenge the court's jurisdiction. <clears throat> to survive a Rule 12B1 motion, the plaintiff bears the burden of establishing that the court has jurisdiction by a preponderance of the evidence. So preponderance of the evidence means it doesn't need to be clear and convincing. It doesn't need to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It just means there has to be a few things that kind of come together in a pile of stuff that shows it's possible. So preponderance of evidence could be statute, it could be the act itself, it could be papers and stuff. I mean, it could be many different things, but it, it only has to allow for the court to have probable cause to believe that, you know, something did go wrong and someone was violated under that act. Okay, so <clears throat> Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife, because Rule 12B1 
concerns a court's ability to hear a particular claim, the court must scrutinize the plaintiff's allegations more closely when considering a motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 12b-1 than it would under a motion to dismiss under Rule 12b-6. Schmidt versus U.S. Capitol Police. In so doing, the court must accept as true all of the factual allegations in the complaint and draw all reasonable inferences in favor of the plaintiff, but the court need not accept inferences unsupported by the facts alleged or the legal conclusions that are cast as factual allegations. So when I make an allegation in fact and nobody rebuts it, it becomes a fact on the record. It becomes something that they can weigh in as being evidence in preponderance thereof, which is why we file our affidavits with only facts, fact. Officer, <clears throat> Officer D could not legally determine a lawful stop occurred because he wasn't present. Fact, Officer D could not have uh, acted in his, uh, the uh, scope of his authority to conduct an arrest because no law exists for uh, or obligation exists to a citizen to furnish an ID under law, right? Those are facts. He can't dispute them. And if, if I put them on the file in an affidavit and he doesn't dispute them, we can now ultimately discern with the fact that he knew it. He knew he couldn't, he knows he can't, and he can't produce anything to um, con nothing contrary to my facts. So if he doesn't rebut them after 30 days, they now become facts on the record. And I can use them if I go into the court, the federal court to bring forth a color of law complaint because he agreed, he acquiesced. <clears throat> so legal conclusions would be me saying that obstruction of ID, um, didn't apply in this instance because it was a subsequent uh, it was a subsequent offense by which if the first offense was not criminal in nature then this couldn't have been applied you know so you're coming to a conclusion based on what the, the law says so those the facts is just what happened exactly as you remember it and that's it and if you have any evidence to back it up say like a camera from you know their car or from you know their uh, person and you have a more more that you have it becomes a preponderance thereof um, in reviewing a motion to dismiss pursuant to rule 12b1 the court may consider such materials outside the pleadings as it deems appropriate to resolve the question of whether it has jurisdiction to hear the case so this is a uh, tricky when they talk about they can consider materials outside of the pleadings I'm not real sure if they're talking about specific evidence attached there too, or are they talking about the reports that people have um, made claims against you that you never see? Because these observers take notes and they put them into the justice system and the court can review those notes and you cannot. So they could have said all kinds of things about you. Are they taking that into consideration in the Fed court? Hard to say, I'm gonna probably go with, yeah, I would believe that that's exactly what they would do to keep you know, the state protected because they're not trying to protect you, they're trying to protect the state. So faced with motions to dismiss under rule 12B1 and 12B6, a court should first consider the rule 12B1 motion because once a court determines that it lacks subject matter jurisdiction, it can proceed no further. So if they decide that there is no act that provided the the plaintiff with relief, they can dismiss for lack of subject matter. And this is real tricky when we look at some of these acts because a lot of times, even though it has mandated language and using the words like, it's you shall do this or shall do that or whatever, ultimately, if legislature doesn't specifically state inside of that act that we have a right to sue for something that happens under that act, they can in fact dismiss it for lack of subject matter jurisdiction because there was no right of the party to um, be protected or to sue. So it can be a little tricky and I might show some cases so that you can understand when that right exists in, this, in the act and when it doesn't. It, and again, you really need to look for the act to specify that you have a right to something. 
It literally has to say that. If it doesn't say that, then it might be that there is no right created by the act and therefore you don't have a standing to bring an action. Okay, so <clears throat> rule 12B6 is the motion they use to bring a failure to state a claim. Uh, so this motion pursuant to federal rule civil procedure 12B6 tests the legal sufficiency of the complaint. Browning versus Clinton. A complaint must contain a short plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief in order to give the defendant fair notice of what the claim is and the grounds upon which it rests, which brings me back to what I was telling you about the statute giving a right to something. If the statute grants a right, then that would mean that you have grounds for relief because it would also then therefore say, or it should also say what the relief will be. So we look for those specific languages in, this, in the acts that we're using to bring forth a motion into the federal court. So despite this liberal pleading standard to survive a motion to dismiss, a complaint must contain sufficient factual matter, except as true to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. So it can't be like totally out there. If you don't have, it's a preponderance of evidence that's not either clear and convincing or uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, such as a video or, you know, picture or something. What you're claiming has to sound plausible. Is it, is it, is it something that could occur? So is it possible that the cops had uh, somehow coerced or intimidated you? And is it just because you say that? Or how else can we dis dis disseminate with that? How can we determine it was plausible? Well, we can see that say the stop, uh, the detainer action lasted 45 minutes. Therefore, we can now say it's plausible that you're telling the truth in the fact that they coerced and intimidated you because there's no reason to detain someone for 45 minutes. That's a fishing expedition. You know, that means that they didn't have probable cause to believe you're in the commencement of a crime and they held you that long because they intended on trying to make you admit you did a crime or make you do something, say something wrong, okay? So <clears throat> a claim is facially plausible when the facts pled into the complaint allow the court to draw the reasonable inference that the defendant is liable for the misconduct alleged. This is also important because we have to, again, go back to who's the liable party. In the case of the doctor and the nurse, would it be the nurse or would it be the doctor? So if we bring the nurse to bar, it may be thrown out for the fact that she might not be the liable party. We should have went after the doctor for the negligence of his education over the nurse and his lack of oversight over said nurse, okay? The standard does not amount to, the, to a probability requirement but it does require more than a sheer possibility that a defendant has acted unlawfully. When ruling on a defendant's motion to dismiss pursuant to Rule 12b-6, a judge must accept as true all of the factual allegations contained in the complaint. Now, again, those allegations only become factual when nobody rebuts them. So if the cop says he lawfully arrested, lawfully stopped, and I say nothing, it now becomes a factual allegation until I say, no, that's not what happened, okay? So Alton vs. DC Office of the Mayor, in addition, the court must give the plaintiff the benefit of all inferences that can be derived from the facts alleged. Analysis, defendants argue that the claims in this case should be dismissed under Federal Rule 12b-1 because plaintiff MJ, LR, and Disability Right DC lack standing and alternatively that the case could, should be dismissed under the federal rule 12b6 because the plaintiffs have failed to state a claim. The court discusses each argument in turn. So in order to establish subject matter jurisdiction, a court must find that at least one plaintiff has standing to bring the case under Article 3 of the United States Constitution in regards to Mendoza versus Perez. To have standing, a plaintiff must have one, suffered an injury in fact and two, that it is fairly traceable to the challenged conduct of the defendant, and three, that it is likely to be redressed by a favorable judicial decision. An injury in fact, so what injury in fact can one suffer, right? There's many ways you can go with it, but, but a quick and short analysis or quick, quick example is in Illinois, mom brings case to um, 
court because her child gave his thumbprint to the uh, theme park, theme park banked it. Now, although he didn't actually sustain an injury, the Supreme Court in Illinois ruled that because the Data Privacy Act provides a right to said privacy and that privacy was violated, that that then means an injury was suffered simply based on the fact that a right was violated. So this can be a broad statement right there. And we have to look and see where our rights are showing in a clear, clear way, and we can raise that issue. So <clears throat> Spokio Inc. versus Robbins, to establish injury in fact, a plaintiff must show that he or she suffered an invasion of a legally protected interest that is concrete and particularized and actual or imminent, not conjectural or hypothetical. The party invoking federal jurisdiction bears the burden of establishing these elements. Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife. Because the elements of standing are not mere pleading requirements, but rather an indispensable part of a plaintiff's case, they each must be supported in the same way as any other matter in which the plaintiff bears the burden of proof, i.e. with the manner and degree of evidence required at the successive stage of the litigation. So they are determining that, that uh, MJ does have standing. Um, defendants argue she lacks an injury in fact because she has previously declined the type of services she now seeks in this suit. Defendants also argue that claims are, are a moot because any legally co cognizable interest in the outcome of the litigation was extinguished once she refused those services. And that's gonna, that's kind of really detailed. I won't get into why they um, are analyzing it that way. I mean, I think it's self-explanatory anyway, but the point is um, they are going to lose this particular argument. So when they're saying that an injury in fact was not sustained, they are incorrect according to this courtroom because of the fact that she ended up institutionalized where it could have been prevented. And that's a key factor in all the courts we're in because this is the court's duty when they talk about protecting your rights. And in order to prevent institutionalization, it would be relevant in my opinion thus far, but we're gonna find out, but it would be relevant that the fact finder, the arbitrator, the judge, magistrate, whatever, would first determine if the agent was operating outside, outside the scope of their authority before bringing you in there. And if she did that, that would definitely be a preventative measure to institutionalization. So this is something I'm gonna save for another um, broadcast because it, it's very, very detailed. Today, I just wanted you guys to understand jurisdictional arguments and what it means to be under jurisdiction and kind of just a very basic overview of how we can get into color of law suits, okay? So as you can see, you know, they're talking more into the standing issues. Uh, I don't wanna make this video go too long. I think that this, you know, gets the message across. And if it did not, if you wanna know more, if you want me to get into more details, if you want me to um, put out more videos in regards to this particular case and cases like it, I'll be happy to do that. But let me know what you're thinking. Let me know um, how you feel about all the things that we talked about here today. If it was helpful to you, let me know that as well hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. Uh, check out Iron Sharpens Iron's uh, website and our um, other platforms. It's my understanding that at this time, um, YouTube may be getting rid of people who are not what is called commercially viable. And with that being said, just in case the platform gets taken down before we've even had a chance to build it up, we've kind of went ahead and put up other platforms. So. We really encourage you to get from, at least get familiar with them just in case you don't see us on YouTube anymore uh, after December 10th. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. It's hard to say that the language is vague, but at least now you know that there is something out there where you can get some pr pretty good information, I believe. I think we're telling you some good stuff here and hopefully helpful to you and definitely, definitely more to come. Um, my goal is to teach you how the, the system works internally. Uh, and this is a lot of information, so it's gonna have to be in pieces, but ultimately in learning why the judges are actually prescribing medical treatments and how it gets billed is, is I think very important for us to know. I think that it's um, imperative for us to understand because 
when one is applying medical treatments and social services to correct your behavior, this absolutely means it must be consensual. And I'm gonna teach you guys as much as I have learned and, and can about how the game is played from that perspective. Now, as I had gotten into the court, um, I could tell you exactly, I've done it many times, so I, I can tell you exactly how they're doing it. You know, if, if you go into the court and they try to get you to have an attorney, you know, this means you're pleading to the court for something. And, and if they didn't have personal jurisdiction, they just got it. So they'll yell, they'll scream, they'll get crazy about it just because they're trying to persuade you out of your own will for not wanting the attorney into wanting an attorney. And if you do that, you make a plea to the court to get a continuance for said attorney, you now enter into personal, jurisdic personal jurisdiction. So we're gonna go over that game in uh, the future video, probably the next one, so that you understand all the different little psychological games. You'll learn how to identify them and how to keep yourself safe from them. So if that's something that you wanna hear more about, let me know again, we'll do some more videos, as many as we can, we're here for you. And if there's something in particular you would like to learn more about, just let us know again in the comment section. And until then, we'll see you at the next one and have a great afternoon, everybody stay safe.